I feel uh, I really don't uh, feel like talking now after these you no know, two revolutionary sages from two religious uh, theologies, uh, you know, making this fantastic enlightenment and revolution at the same time with their respective communities. Uh, so I this I'm really thankful to the hosts for giving me this opportunity, this learning opportunity of life, uh, which is really encouraging for me because uh, I'm in the same path, not in the theologistic way, uh, over the past 18 years with the local communities, especially the indigenous societies of Eastern India. Uh, so I'll just uh, try to share with you some of our my own personal experience with 15 different communities, uh, indigenous communities of India and three societies from North America and one from China. Yeah, the next one, please. Uh, I begin with this, you know, the, mainly the customary protection. Uh, these are the reflections of these indigenous societies' view of nature. And essentially, all the resources, the, mainly the living resource, resources that they use, are governed by different kinds of ethical systems of harvesting those resources. Uh, the primary one is the hunting ethics, that there are strictures against uh, hunting uh, a pregnant doe, for example, or uh, the birds with, with eggs in the nest. If, if a person, if a hunter wants to uh, harvest their eggs from a nest, bird's nest, it, the nest must contain more than three nests, uh, eggs in each nest. If it is Three or less, no egg should be touched, and so on and so forth. And there will be closed seasons, and these are universal. I mean, these are the, it's not specific to some Indian tribe or Native American society or Thai uh, people. It's all over the world, the hunter-gatherer societies, they have all these kind of closed seasons of fishing, for example. So different fishes have their, and all of these hunting ethics, closed seasons of hunting or fishing, uh, coincide with the breeding periods of those respective species. So it seems that now people understood over thousands and thousands of years of empirical experience that if they harvest those species during their breeding periods, that will actually decimate the, the resource base. And therefore, they designed many of these cultural institutions to, to prevent that kind of disaster for the future generations and also for themselves for the future years. And uh, these, uh, just in contrast, talk about this, you know, think about this modern industrial fishery. Uh, this was actually published in Nature, and the study was from 1950 to 2000. And they found that in just 50 years, the entire stock of all big fishes of the world have been decimated by 90%. Just 10% of all the fish population of the world are remaining in, si in population size. And they remark that not just in some, some areas, not just for some stocks, but for the entire communities of these fish species from the tropics to the poles. This is the consequence of scientific fishery, industrial fishery, in contrast with the uh, at least 30,000 years of artisanal fishery by the indigenous people. And there lies the superiority of the mode of resource use by the indigenous societies all over the, all over the world. Next. Uh, it's not just you know, hunting and gathering, also the agricultural things. In fact, all the crops and animals that we have domesticated all over the world for food, for wool, for meat, for milk, anything, for silk, all of these domesticated animals and plants, 300 species of plants and 72 vertebrates were all domesticated by ancient uh, indigenous people. We don't know the names of those societies. We don't know, these, you know the innovators. They're unknown, unnamed scientists. But the most amazing thing is that the last animal that was domesticated, oh, by the way, I must define this domestication. Domestication is not just keeping pets. Domestication is creation of a new species which did not exist in the world until the domestication process. So example is a dog. The dog never existed in the wild. It was created in the hands of humans. 17,000 years ago, 
from the ancestral population of Eurasian wolf. Canis familiaris, the new species, came to being 17,000 years, uh, years ago. And similarly, each of the 300 species of animals, whether it's cow, horse, donkey, uh, chicken, ducks, you name it, any of these domesticated animals, and all the domesticated crops, whether it's rice, wheat, beans, aubergine, okra, none of these crop species ever existed in the world until humans created them. And this is what Charles Darwin called the force of artificial selection, modeling which he invented this natural selection to make that population. Ne next one, please. This is just like a few examples, you know, the beginning with dog. And the last animal that was domesticated was 3,000 years ago, yama and alpaca. Now, the most astonishing thing is that in these last 3,000 years, I mean, from 3,000 years ago till today, humans have been able to explode nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs, send people to the moon, and so on and so forth, but have not so far been able to add one single species to this list. And we, we consider our educational institutions and scientific institutions ignore this fantastic feat of scientific innovation by those ancient people. They didn't know what DNA was. They didn't know about protein and all this nu nuclear bonding, but they achieved to create those new species. Next, please. Not just the species, but for each species of domesticated crops and animals, pe ancient people also exploded the genetic diversity. Rice, on which I've been working over these uh, 20 years, in India, the biggest number of, largest number of land races, one, the estimated number is 110,000, until 1970, until the advent of the Green Revolution. It was the recorded number, acknowledged by I, IRRI and uh, NBPGR. But similarly, you know, whether it's corn or potato, wheat, mango, everything, all of these uh, crop species had thousands and thousands of varieties, at least hundreds of varieties for each, all of these. Now, this this creation of these species and this genetic diversity took tens of thousands of years to create. It took us only 30 years of scientific advancement to delete all of these, to expand this diversity through monoculture and in, in innovations of the so-called high yielding varieties and hybrid varieties. So it's on all continents the same. This is aubergine diversity from Bengal. On, our, on my own farm, we are growing 19 varieties of aubergines. Next one, please. Uh, different varieties of uh, legumes. Next. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, just a glimpse of the uh, varieties of rice that I am growing on my own farm uh, from the collection of 1,200 varieties that we grow each year. And the upper one is the, you know, the hull and the dehulled grain on the bottom uh, of each variety. There are many, I mean, just, just, just the visual things that you can see. You can't see, you can't feel the aroma, the taste, the pest, uh, pest resistance property or drought tolerance property or, and so on and so forth. But you can see this, you know, the, the middle, you can see this long grain with a wing-like structure on the sides. Uh, these are the sterile lemma that has in, you know, uh, increased, exceeded the length of the rice grain. This is one of the three varieties recorded in international uh, rice records, genetic records. I own two of them. I mean, I am uh, nurturing two of these varieties from the tribal areas. The reason that the uh, indigenous farmers are growing is not for any kind, any particular economic value, but for the aesthetic value or the intrinsic value. It's so unique, so let's keep it and grow it. This sense of valuation non-monetary value, non-economic, non-use value is inherent and ingrained in most of the indigenous societies, which unfortunately we are taught to lose and discard. Next one, please. This is another uh, exceptional variety, and I'm very sad when I show this because I happen to be the last repository in the world of this variety. This is the only variety in the world which contains three grains in each spikelet. The farmer who actually was growing it, who donated this to me, he died next year. And his son, who was educated, he was educated with his matriculation and the school examination, 
So he learned uh, enough about gravitational theory and nitrogen and oxygen and so on and so forth. So he considered that this is unscientific because his textbooks didn't mention it. So he threw it away in, uh, in favor of IR36 and so on. So eventually I am the last repository. But these are the only things you know, which I can share with you visually. There are hundreds of grains, I mean varieties, which I cannot communicate with you with through visual means because as uh, Father has already mentioned, you have to experience, you have, you have to feel some of those and you have to experience the taste, aroma and all the other interactions. But these are the results of traditional agricultural knowledge and innovation. The, the white grains in the, uh, in the left, upper one, was one variety that was created I don't know how many centuries ago, but one farmer just about 10 years ago, he spotted, identified a particular a mutation in the same variety of rice, one single panicle of rice, and he, through selected breeding, created the red rice on the right. And it became a pure line selection, it became a new variety. His son, inspired by his father's success, in three years' time, he spotted another mutation and created, in the fourth year, this black, pure black rice from the same, you know, some other genetic mutations. Now, it happened that I was witnessing this, over this, you know, 10 years of record of how these novel varieties were created by uh, illiterate farmers who can't even know how to sign their documents. They don't know what this, you know, what, are the, what kinds of portions of DNA is responsible for that, what are the enzymes responsible for this, but they've achieved it, something that genetic engineers can't imagine. Next, please. So this traditional agricultural knowledge, just like traditional ecological knowledges, knowledge systems, they are all transmitted through oral traditions, not written records. And, but this knowledge, I mean, traditional knowledge is not congealed it's not dead, it's not fossilized. It keeps on you know, changing and innovating. So, and each of these knowledge system or part of the knowledge is tested and validated by each generation, by each community, whether it is applicable in that particular context, in that land, in that climatic condition, soil condition. And if it is validated, then it's, it's uh, fixed. If it is not, then it's modified to suit that, you know, and that, that's what we now in modern language call appropriation of technology. This appropriate technology concept was actually uh, evolving for thousands of years in different communities. And then after this, this technology is open, free exchange, open exchange resources, just like, you know, our Ubuntu and all of these. It's decentralized, it's open source, and nobody claims any patent on it, any of these. So we don't know uh, who is the creator of jasmine rice of Thailand or basmati rice. But the whole world is in, has inherited it until in WTO some company patented on it. But for thousands of years, nobody thought of it. Everyone was shared. Next one, please. Uh, this uh, no, non-use value that I mentioned already about this intrinsic value of these systems or not just the uh, uh, use value of all these used uh, resources. There are many, many items of the resource which are never used in life by any humans, but nevertheless they are protected. Next one. So the best examples are the totems and taboos on different kinds of species. Next one. There are many other sacred species all over India. In the, the green gecko is the only species in the Andaman Island, uh, Felsuma, and this is now surviving in one single island of the Onge people. Uh, Onge and Jarawas are the Africanoid, you know, Negroid people in uh, the Indian islands. And it's surviving only on that single island because on all other islands, the modern people have arrived and they ignore all, the, all of these kind of taboos. So the green geckos are still happily living on that particular island only because they're protected culturally and religiously by those people. Nevertheless, they never use any of this. They never kill this gecko but they considered it's valuable to the ecosystem. Next one. It's not just species, but also habitats, sacred habitats. These were all, you know, I already mentioned in the uh, first half that it was abundant in all, on all living continents, you know, excepting Antarctica. So 
uh, and I know Thailand and yeah. Laos and Cambodia all have this, you know, this kind of sacred groves and uh, sacred patches of forests which are considered sacred. Although there has been no uh, sign of you know, images uh, of any deity, these are the traditional ones which were maintained by, next please, uh, next. I'm not going into the mathematical details about this in the modern research, but this has been recognized by internationally uh, with the UNDP and IUCN and all of these, the importance of natural sacred groves and sacred ponds uh, for conservation. Next. And the whole system of this, now as ecologists, uh, being a qualified ecologist, I was really uh, astonished to find, uh, we discovered a very close uh, coincidence between all those sacred species and the, what we now, ta now call keystone species. All of the sacred species in India are keystone species. Not all keystone species are sacred species. But necessarily all the, key, all the sacred species that we identified happen to be keystone species. Keystone is a concept borrowed from architecture, just like this, this is this arch. And you know, arch is the most stable structure architecturally. And this central stone, which actually holds the two sides of the arch is called keystone. If you remove this keystone, the whole arch collapses. That's the key role of the keystone species. If you remove this keystone species, the whole ecosystem will collapse. Somehow these people had discovered this functional role of these keystone species, whether it's the banyan tree or adena quadifolia, which are never used for any other economic use. But nevertheless, people, these people identified it 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, and they protected it in the name of sacred species. And we call it superstition, but now we are beginning to discover that they had very profound scientific understanding of nature, what Father had already mentioned. It's the interaction, the knowledge and wisdom from interaction. And this, very fortunately, despite the religious regimes changing, in Bangladesh, for example, earlier it was a, a Hindu kingdom, then it became Buddhist kingdom, then it became again Hindu kingdom, then it became Muslim, then the British took, took over, then Pakistan took over. So religious regimes kept on changing, but this particular sacred species, this banyan tree, is still maintained sacred over the past 600 years. So it doesn't matter when the, what the government changed, what the people's belief systems changed, but this particular custom, customary protection continued with different kinds of guises. In this uh, Bengali uh, language they, read, they wrote, it's no longer worshipped because Islam uh, is opposing this you know, nature worship. But they now dedicate this tree in the name of a Sufi saint, Mainuddin Chishti. So it's protected still now. Next one. The result, as an ecologist, I'm interested in because these sacred groves are the last bastions of critically engendered, endangered and endemic species of many plants and animals which are not found elsewhere in the world. This is one example, Kuncleria keralensis. This is the last population of this liana, woody climber, which is found in one single sacred grove in Kerala. It doesn't occur elsewhere in the world. Next one, please. This is another one that I discovered, uh, Vitex glabrata. The only single specimen of, the species, of this species is existing in India in one single sacred grove. If that tree is cut down, the species will go off forever. Next. So there are sacred groves and sacred ponds, and in this pond we have discovered many uh, two new species of zooplankton uh, 15 years back. This is another sacred pond attached to a tribal temple. Mm. And the turtle in the background is, uh, is uh, uh, one, the last species, last population of that species in the entire North India. And must have been you know, abundant elsewhere, but now they have been you know, killed off. But this is the last habitat that is still, still remaining. There are sacred heron reeds, uh, bat roosts, but now, these are all being destroyed with the advent of modernity and invasion of the market. So now the indigenous people themselves are lured for money to sell those, you know, <coughs> their own forests, uh, trees, to sell on the market for commodity. This is the invasion of the commodity that I, we have to be, you know, we have to fighting. We are all fighting against this. But this is really a very difficult struggle that we all understand. Next one. 
The result is that you now we have this kind of uh, degradation of the sacred groves, uh, destruction of this, theft of the trees, state forestry's operation, that, uh, and then plantation of eucalyptus and other exotic species that destroys this ecosystem. Finally, only just a few species remain, uh, trees remain in the sacred grove, and lastly, no trees remain, only the altar remains, <laughs> and we call it sacred grove. That's the irony and tragedy of our sacred ecosystems and the traditions. A poor si muove is an Italian phrase told by Galileo when he was actually accosted by the uh, church that now you must admit that you were wrong. The earth does not move around the sun. It's a blasphemy. You must admit it was wrong. So you now say earth does not move, move around the sun. The Galileo said, yes, I admit, because it was his life's question. Then finally he said, sotto voce, a poor si muove, but still it moves. Whether I say it or not, the, the earth moves around the sun. <laughs> Fine, so this is the same thing. Next one. This, very fortunately, this biophilia, the love and respect for life, continues in all these traditional societies, regardless of the modernity and these you know, market ones. That's the desideratum that still you know, uh, continues. So you, these, you know, these people, you know, uh, this owl, the uh, fledgling, is now being uh, now a pet, and this, this uh, bird is unwilling to leave the hand of the boy. Next one. Rescuing the bat. Next. And many other cultural traditions, including folk do uh, dances in uh, Eastern India and in Native American uh, societies as well, they are all surrounded around, I mean, uh, centered around uh, these sacred species and sacred groves and sacred ponds. So the summary of this is that you now we have this ecological ethic, indigenous ecological ethic, that's biophilia, respect for nature, and which are reflected in different institutions, like sacred species, sacred groves, customary harvesting quotas, food cultures. And the result of all this conservation implications is that either you conserve the species or conserve the genetic diversity of rice or, or mango or whatever, or you protect the entire habitat in the name of its sacred groves and ponds. Next one. That's the sign of this you know, development that is, that is the major impact. And that happens to be the goal and reference point of development. If you consume 2 million beverage bottles every minute, every five minutes, that's a token of development because you, may, you have GDP growth. Now, is, is this, uh, this is the development possible, uh, development path. Is that possible? is alternative to imagine. <laughs> Next one, please. Now, why we just had a fantastic discussion about this and why indigenous people don't own land on all continents. No. The, uh, just one minute. This is a very interesting one that we found that you know, the natural resources, if it's a, a renewable resource, then economists calculate the price of the land as the rent of the land divided by the interest rate or discount rate. Okay? Now, my own you know, 18 years of study in all indigenous societies is that indigenous people never have any discount rate. And very interestingly, both Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad all talked against interest, taking interest, usually. Jesus in his whole life of, you know, teaching, of, teaching of, and preaching of nonviolence became extremely violent only once in, a, in, in his lifetime. You remember that? He whipped out the usurers from the temple, right? Because he was against the interest rate. And this is exactly the restatement of all the indigenous societies of the interest rate. Now, if you put D is zero, what would be the price? D is interest rate, okay? If anything divided by zero, is infinity. That implies you cannot buy any natural good. You cannot buy the land, you cannot buy a tree, you cannot own or sell any part of nature, and therefore none of the indigenous societies can buy or sell or own any part of land. Next one. So that's the traditional, uh, okay. traditional con uh, communitarian ethos uh, where it's the, uh, because nobody owns the land, it becomes a community property, commons, and individuals are forbidden to destroy it. 
So the sacred groves remain because it becomes a community property. The whole commons uh, take care of it, not an individual. Next. So that's the, our uh, combination of the civic democracy where participatory democracy, real grassroots democracy, which still prevails in most of the uh, society, indigenous societies, then biophilia and ecocentric ethos that we have already mentioned, and finally, the uh, communitarian ethos. These three combined is the, our major goal that we imagine would be possible to uh, stem this advancement of uh, modernity and develop mentality. I'm sorry for if I have taken another extra minute for you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.